So we didn't have much of a storm this morning, did we? I mean, a bit of rain. It's Storm Sunday, you know, I had sent off a memo saying we could use a hurricane or something, but oh well, rain was better than nothing. I did think, though, of a wonderful storm that we had in Vermont. I lived in Vermont for many years. I lived there for 11 years, which equals 27 winters, approximately. <laughs> Winter in Vermont really does last a long, long time. And the church that I was serving in Waterbury, we would put up this big shed every December um, and put the nativity scene in it. And on Christmas Eve, we would put baby Jesus in the manger. But the shed would stay up for months because that ground was frozen and there was probably three or four feet of snow around it. And no one was going to take that thing down. We always hoped every year that there would be enough of a thaw before Easter to get the Christmas stable down. It did not always happen. But one year, lo and behold, the snowfall was so heavy, the roof on the stable caved in. And I was out looking at it as this fellow walked by, and he said, you know, Herod and all his armies couldn't kill baby Jesus. It took a Vermont snowstorm. Storms are powerful things. And you know, as I was reflecting on storms, I was realizing one of the oddities about storms, whether they're snowstorms or hurricanes or thunder and lightning, etc., is there is not a whole lot we can do about them, is there? They happen. We can brace ourselves. We can, you know, put boards over windows. We can hide indoors by the fire, etc., etc. But if a storm is coming, it's coming. And we can cross our fingers and hope for the best, but it's going to happen. Life is just like that. All the storms we have in life, and I'm not talking now about snowstorms and thunder and lightning, I'm talking about all those things that happen when we're least expecting them and we go, whoa! All those things that happen in life, often there isn't a whole lot we can do about them except brace ourselves and get through them. So on this Storm Sunday, I was intrigued to, to look at the Scripture readings. And I intentionally chose the version that John read from, even though, you know, that Corinthians one was a little difficult. First of all, it said, we do something really stupid, we use preaching. And I thought, hmm, where does that leave me? But if you notice a few verses later, it said, have you noticed, folks, that none of you are the brightest and the best? So, I mean, <laughs> none of us really get through that passage on good footing. But it's a fascinating passage, isn't it? Paul says, you know what, folks? In essence, the gospel is foolish. Okay. Kind of strange. I expect Paul to say something like, the gospel is wonderful and profound and life-changing. And he says, the gospel, to most people, is completely idiotic. He goes on. It says it's for those who are not on the path of salvation. It does not make any sense. Jews are looking for a miracle, he says. Greeks are looking for wisdom or, in some translations, looking for logic. And in the meantime, we're saying our hope comes from crucifixion. It is a wacky statement. Now, I need to step aside, so to speak, and just give a little tiny insight to Paul's language here. Um, first of all, Paul is a Jew. Paul goes to his grave believing himself emphatically to be a devout Jew. So when Paul talks about Jews, he is not talking about them. He's talking about us, okay? So when Paul says Jews are looking for something, it's kind of like saying, you know, if one of us were to say something like, you know, us Canadians are really nice, really good looking, decent folks, whatever. That's kind of what Paul is saying when he says Jews are looking for, for miracles. He's saying, you know, people like us, we, we want miracles. That's, that's who we are. It's not them. It's us. Greeks also are not people who live in the nation that we now know as Greece. It did not exist back then. Greek was Jewish shorthand or Bible speak for everybody who's not one of us. So when Paul says Jews are looking for this, it's, you know, people like us are looking for miracles. Everybody else is looking for logic. And this small, little, tiny, ragtag band of us called Christians, we're running around and we're not giving people a miracle. 
We're not giving them great arguments of logic that say, this is why you should be a Christian, because this, this, and this. No, Paul says, we go running around saying, you know how we know that God loves us? Somebody died. And that's a little odd. We also need to remember, Paul is not pointing fingers here. I've heard people take this passage and go, ah, he's talking about the other guys. No, he's not. He's just talking about us. And he's saying, you know, the message that we have, the one thing that we can hang on to, he doesn't say this, but it's kind of there in the background, when storms are happening around us, the one piece that we've got that led us through the storms is knowing that Jesus died And it's because for Paul at this point, Paul's been talking before about Jesus' death as being an amazing thing because Jesus kept saying, in essence, I'm going to show you God's love. And Jesus kept showing us God's love. Jesus kept proclaiming God's love that was unconditional, that was for all people. And through his life, in essence, says, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep demonstrating God's love no matter what. You can kill me, and I will keep doing it. And of course, we know the story. Jesus was killed for proclaiming God's love, and what happens? He turns around and comes right back and keeps on doing it. And for Paul, at this point in Paul's theology and in his career, this is the most crucial piece. This is what Jesus does for us, is not to stop proclaiming God's love no matter what is going on. Yeah, that does seem kind of silly, especially if you're standing in the outside going, I can't believe it. This is all they've got to go on. This is all they've got to base their faith on. But it's because of all that it means. It's because of all the context around that simple death that for Paul is so transforming, so life-changing. It's a reminder to us of what God gives us. God gives us hope. Sometimes, I've got to tell you, hope does not seem like much. But hope is everything. Think of that scene at the beginning of Schindler's List where after Schindler has gone to Yitzhak Stern and said, I want you to run a company for me. And Stern is like, okay. And Schindler says, and I want you to get some money for me. And Stern says, what the heck are you going to do? You know, Schindler wants a company, but he's not going to invest any money and he's not going to run it. So Stern gets some investors. And I love this scene. The investors come to Stern with their money and they, or to, to Schindler, and they say, okay, we're going to invest in your company. If we do that, we're not saying we're going to, but if we do that, what do we get in return? They're thinking, what kind of interest? And Schindler says, I'll give you pots and pans. That is not what they were expecting, right? You invest in a business, and somebody says, okay, you invest in my business. Give me $500,000. I'll give you a couple of pots and pans. No. And yet, as it turns out, they're of more value than anything else would have been. Because when these people get thrown into the ghetto and then later into a camp, all that they can do is trade on the black market and pots and pans are like solid gold. Sometimes what we get is not what we're expecting. Sometimes what we receive from God is is not what we think we need, but it's exactly what we need. I love the story about Jeremiah. Jeremiah buys a piece of land and he gives us incredible minute details with lots of great big huge long Hebrew names. Thank you, John. Good job. Lots of great big huge Hebrew names to explain in great detail. This is how it happened. I bought a piece of land. The context of the story is this is when the nation is on its very last legs. Everybody knew at the time that Jeremiah did this, everybody knew that the nation was about to cease to exist. They're being conquered by the Babylonians, the Assyrians, all the bad guys, all the outsiders, all of the people of any worth, of any education, of any value as such in the society are being sent off into exile. And they're not going to be a a nation much longer. And in the midst of all of this, Jeremiah comes along and he says, I'm going to buy a piece of land. And undoubtedly, everybody thinks... Jeremiah, you're completely crazy. And he said, no, I bought a piece of land and I made sure that I did everything correct and, you know, we wrote out all the deeds, I paid the exact sum, I had witnesses to make sure it was all being done properly, wrote out the documents, 
filed them away in clay jars so that they would last forever. It's like putting them in a safety deposit box. And people are watching Jeremiah and thinking, you are crazy to do all of this. It's not going to matter. The future is approximately seven minutes long. It's going to be over soon. And Jeremiah says, yeah, but God told me something. God said there is a future. God said there is hope. God said there's a reason to carry on. Read a great poem the other day. It's a short one. I wanted to read it because it's so powerful in its simple words. It's by Pete Hein. Pete Hein was a Danish scientist who also wrote about 20,000 poems, little short poems like this one. This was his first poem, and he published it under a false name in Denmark during the Nazi occupation. And what was fascinating is the Danes understood the poem. The Germans didn't. And it ended up being written in graffiti all over Denmark. And it inspired people to realize, hang in there. The storm of this war is horrendous, but hang in there. It goes like this. Losing one glove is certainly painful, but nothing compared to the pain of losing one, throwing away the other, and finding the first one again. Isn't that brilliant? It was Heinz's way of saying, yeah, it's horrible that we've lost our freedom and we've lost our identity as a nation because we've been occupied. But it would be worse to collaborate with the enemy only then to have the enemy disappear and us to regain our freedom, find the glove again. People got that. And people in Denmark decided that they would resist the occupation as much as they could. And one of the things that comes out of Denmark's history in the Second World War is that approximately 100 Jews were killed in Denmark. Approximately 8,000 survived. As they read that all over the place and they realized, hang in there, the storm that is happening is horrible. But there's a tomorrow. It's all that God offers us. When push comes to shove, all that we get in the storms of life is the simple reminder that God will be there when the snow is falling, when the winds are blowing, when life is crashing all around us. That's all we get. And it is everything.